Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another of a brief series of reviews examining a classic role-playing game by Steve Jackson Games that has recently been reprinted and revived, The Fantasy Trip. While written by Steve Jackson, The Fantasy Trip was originally published as a series of minigames by Metagaming Concepts starting in the late 70s. In recent years, the property was reclaimed by Steve Jackson Games and cleaned up for republication. This time I'm going to take a look at The Fantasy Trip in the Labyrinth the main proper RPG supplement for the Fantasy Trip. Originally published back in 1980, In the Labyrinth originally pretty much required either the Fantasy Trip Melee, the Fantasy Trip Wizard, or both in order to properly play. It expands the rules past the combat and into everything else that you'd need to play a full adventure. The modern version includes not only the original rules, but also the material from the Fantasy Trip Advanced Melee and the Fantasy Trip Advanced Wizard. This allows it to be a standalone RPG all in all since those advanced supplements included the basic rules for combat and spellcasting. Rather than a box set as the prior Fantasy Trip products, In the Labyrinth is a single book. It does rely on the same hex and mega hex system as other Fantasy Trip entries, however. I'm not entirely sure if the PDF includes the printouts since I don't have the PDF. I got my book as part of the Fantasy Trip Legacy Edition, after all. Still, tokens and counters are easy enough to come up with at the gaming table. Physically, the modern version of the book is a soft cover with a full color cover, black and white interior, clocking in at 176 pages. Interior layout is two column interspersed with tables, diagrams, and inline black and white art, with headings in bold or italics to make finding sections relatively easy, in a style that fans of GURPS books will find quite familiar. It is both easy to navigate and easy to read, but more on that later. In the Labyrinth has four major sections, the first three of which contain a number of chapters each. The first major section is what was originally just in the Labyrinth, back in the day, beginning with an introduction, a general chapter on game mastering and the basic rules, a chapter on creating a character, the spell list, the talent list, handling experience points, some talk of designing a labyrinth, some discussion of the world outside the default setting, and talk of cultures and customs or joinable organizations, talk about preparing an adventure, some talk of running an adventure with specialized exploration rules, and then a list of the creatures of Sidri, basically a bestiary for the default setting. The second major section is Advanced Combat, covering the combat rules from the Advanced Melee supplement from the original printings. This does seem to include the basic combat rules introduced in the Fantasy Trip Melee and the Fantasy Trip Wizard. The third major section is Advanced Magic, which I presume are the Advanced Magic rules from Advanced Wizard. The final major section of the book is actually just two small sections covering the village of Benduin in the southern Elentia. Elentia? Uh, fantasy names. Basically, sample parts of the default world of Sidri that you can set things in. Fantasy Trip does have a default setting in the world of Sidri. It is a massive, constructed world created by a family of people in the long-distant past who had the ability to hop between worlds. As such, it is a way to explain a large variety of technologies, magic, and other elements all mashed together. It's not a bad setting and very open for whatever expansion one could wish, but it's not really actually required to use it. In the Labyrinth starts with an introduction detailing what role-playing is, as well as an introduction to the world of Sidri. This is followed by the Game Mastering chapter, where the basic rules of the game are laid out. It starts with the guidelines on playing GM-run characters, as they call NPCs in this game, then rules on reaction roles, or how NPCs react to the party. Yep, this is one of the few RPGs where that's not only covered, but placed right up front in the book. Which is honestly a bit surprising, considering the Fantasy Trip started as an actual tactical combat game, rather than a social interaction game. Rules for basic success roles follow. The Fantasy Trip uses a D6 versus stat test system, usually 3D6, but difficulty is actually adjusted by changing the number of dice rolled rather than any particular number. There's rules for saving rolls, which are similar, and critical successes and failures, which give number ranges that, when rolled for the various numbers of dice, designated automatic successes and failures. Rules for injury, fatigue, and death, as well as healing, follow, and this is actually one of the trickier parts of the system, since there's no separate hit point or magic point system, but rather everything, injury, fatigue from casting, etc., costs from strength. They heal at different rates, so one must keep track of which strength was lost due to spellcasting, injury, and otherwise. This results in a rather harsh system in terms of keeping characters up, but fortunately there are a few options to keep down characters from dying. 
These are discussed in this section, as well as ways to revive the character. There is then some discussion of the passage of time in the game, followed by a table of useful definitions and abbreviations. The next chapter goes over creating a character, starting with a quick introduction on ideas before going directly into the character creation steps. The fantasy trip doesn't have true classes per se, beyond simply fighters or wizards. These don't necessarily define character abilities, but rather deal with how a character purchases talents versus purchasing spells. Talents function as skills in the fantasy trip, but also represent traits that other characters can learn, while spells are, well, spells. A wizard character pays more for talents than spells, while all, the, all other characters, which are just generally considered warriors, pay more for spells than talents. Characters are given a set amount of silver to start the game, and then choose their abilities out of a certain number of points. Non-human characters may start with different scores in each attribute, as well as some other modifications, as well as starting with different amounts of discretionary points in some instances. There is a page of quick character generation tables for if you can't come up with a concept immediately. In the Labyrinth uses just three attributes, Strength, Dexterity, and Intelligence. Strength functions as hit points and determines what gear a character can use. Dexterity governs how quickly a character may act and is used for a large number of saves and basic two hit rolls, while intelligence governs how many spells and talents that a character can learn, as well as which they can have access to. All spells and talents require a basic number of intelligence to learn, while some talents may have other prerequisites. The next chapter is spells and lists the spells within the game. The spells are divided into tiers determined by how much intelligence is needed to learn that tier of spells. Spells may have different types designated by the letter after their name, throne, missile, creation, or special, which basically designates the broad category of their effects. Each spell has a name, a description of what it does, as well as a cost and strength. This may be a cost of uh, when it is cast, but it is also a cost per turn for those spells that can be maintained over multiple turns. There's actually quite a wide variety of spell effects, covering not only magic useful in combat, but many utility spells as well, useful for general adventuring. The Talents chapter of the book follows, and much like spells, individual talents are divided into tiers depending on the required intelligence to learn them. Some talents, however, may have additional prerequisites. Each talent has a name, the number of intelligence points it costs, then a description of what it does. Talents range as widely as spells do. Some are simple weapon skills, while others provide additional combat options for use during play, and still others offer new things that a character can do during non-combat segments or modify other basic elements of the game. Languages are treated simply as talent. A chapter on experience points follows. The fantasy trip does not use levels, but rather experience points may be used to improve various attributes for increasing costs based on the total number of attributes that a character actually has. They may also be used to learn new spells and talents above and beyond the number allowed by their initial intelligence. There is some discussion on retiring characters here as well. The next section is designing a labyrinth, which includes basic guidelines on building the dungeon or labyrinth in this game. The guidelines are actually pretty useful and include details on doors, traps, monsters, and loot, but also a few sample tables for random dungeon stocking and traps. There's a sidebar covering artifacts, which in the fantasy trip are considered to be items of high technology that have found their way into the world due to the multi-genre nature of the default setting. There's a map and a key example, and the hex-based nature of this game is on clear display here. The World Outside chapter is not all Sidri specific, but gives general details for the sorts of things you'd expect in a scattered medieval world, including guidelines for random encounters, travel speeds, getting lost, and so forth. There's some talk about map scales for detailing maps on hex grids, as well as a sidebar and magical gates. There's discussion on coinage, which does include some assumptions based on the world of Sidri, but is otherwise quite generic. There's discussion of taxes and so forth to use as money sinks, but also an entire section on jobs or earning money between adventures. They use a combination of talents and skills to determine whether a character can do them, and include some consideration on whether the character may still have a job after, say, embarking on a large world-saving excursion that takes months and months. There's even some details on earning raises, bonuses, and promotions. The chapter concludes on something that may be a little bit more relevant for adventurers in a dangerous world, wills and inheritance. The next chapter is on cultures and customs, but doesn't really st detail specific cultures on Sidri. Rather, it functions as a guideline on the sorts of cultures to be expected. 
The bulk of this section, however, is about the various guilds that a character can join and what sorts of benefits and responsibilities they entail. There's also some details on religion, and interestingly enough, a large number of the Sidri religions are taken from real-world religions of the past. This section finishes with a large segment on laws and punishment, although not specific laws. Rather, it just has guidelines on the sorts of laws that characters can run up against and how punishment factors in. The preparing for adventure section follows and really just kind of gives some guidelines on things that the characters should consider before setting out into the adventures, such as assembling a party, dealing with hirelings, finding an employer if they're low level, and obtaining equipment. The encumbrance rules are listed here as well, as is a table of available equipment. The Adventure Begins chapter covers those elements of actually running the game that haven't been covered thus far, at least in terms of tabletop guidelines, dealing with character knowledge, mapping, keeping track of time, lighting and vision, rules for handling doors and traps, the sorts of noise basic exploration causes, examples of nuisance encounters to keep the game moving, and so on. There is an example of the exploration phase of the game here as well. The next chapter is the Creatures of Sidri, and this is a basic bestiary of creatures separated by type. The humanoid races are listed first and differ from the rest of this in that they give rules for using them as characters. Other monster types include long descriptions of the creatures in question, as well as the stats needed to use them as monsters. They aren't laid out in any sort of organized format, so one may need to thoroughly read each entry to see what each monster might do. The number of creatures is relatively small compared to a number of RPGs, but includes a mix of classic mythological creatures as well as unique creations, which some of them are actually pretty amusing. Thus concludes the first section of the book. The next section is labeled Advanced Combat, but in truth it includes the basic rules for melee and wizard as well. I presume this is what is used to be included in the Fantasy Trip Advanced Melee, although that's just me speaking off the cuff since I haven't actually looked at the old versions. The advanced combat begins with a discussion of hexes and mega hexes. Basically, mega hexes are groups of seven hexes that are used for ranging and large scale mapping. The turn sequence follows, with turns just taking five seconds each, and they're divided into several phases. Initiative is rolled each round, with the winner deciding whether they want to go first or not. Then there's dealing with ongoing spells, movements, taking actions, dealing with forced retreats, then dealing with post turn damage or damage from ongoing effects. It should be noted that while all characters move during the movement phase, they select from the list of options when it's their turn. Options that can be taken are limited on whether they're engaged, disengaged, or fighting in hand-to-hand. -hand. Basically, engaged characters can do less since they're actively being threatened, while hand-to-hand -hand characters are treated as if they're being grappled or in very, very close combat. Movement is calculated in four-foot hexes and may be limited based on race, encumbrance, or armor. There are rules for moving multi-hex creatures or large creatures, dealing with moving through other creatures, dealing with flying creatures, crawling, kneeling, and laying prone, each of which may have its own set of modifiers, as well as other actions such as jumping or the like. Rules for surprise and initiative follow, oddly enough, as well as for escaping so as to allow for dealing with characters who just drop everything and flee. Facing rules follow, and they're important, not only for determining whether a character is engaged or not, but also for using ranged devices, seeing whether shields apply to defense, and determining certain combat modifiers. The rules for making attacks follow, and basically boil down to a test. The hit rules, results of critical success and failure, and damage rules are all covered here as well. Armor in the Fantasy Trip basically soaks up an amount of damage from every attack, functioning as damage reduction, and there are some optional rules for armor degradation as well. The weapon table follows, detailing each weapon with a name, damage, strength requirement, cost, weight, and any special notes. Armor follows thereafter, with hit stopped, dex penalty, cost, weight, movement allowance, and any other notes as well. Special rules for certain weapons follow, including offhand weapons, pole arms, and then specific unusual weapons that might have their own rules. A general section on thrown weapons follows as well as missile weapons. Interestingly enough, these missile weapon attacks are more than just attack and then resolve because missed missile weapons don't just magically stop in place. Rather, they follow their trajectory and might hit other targets. General rules for hitting your friends are thus covered, followed by a few other special combat scenarios such as dealing with missile spells and shooting at large targets. A section on hand-to-hand -hand combat follows, which can range from fist fighting to grappling to using daggers and can be difficult to extract oneself from. Dodging and full defense is explained thereafter. 
There are rules for forcing retreat and penalties taken from severe injury. Basically, taking hits while missing your own can cause you to be beaten back a space, and being hit for a lot can penalize your actions thereafter. An extended section on other combat condi conditions follows basically specialized rules for tactical situations that can come up while exploring old ruins and underground tunnels. After this, there's some optional and special rules that can be used, including aimed shots, berserking, and ambushing. Rules for crippling hits are given as optional rules as well, allowing a character to be pretty badly wounded. Normal combat can result in dropped and broken weapons, and these rules are discussed here, as well as rules for well-made weapons and armor. The chapter concludes with special attacks such as fire, gas, gunpowder, poison, and so forth. After a few more discussions of special combat situations, an example of combat is given in detail, allowing for a fairly good demonstration of how combat works in the fantasy trip. Then, the advanced combat section continues with a section on mounted combat, fairly well detailed compared to mounted combat rules for basically most other games, and concludes with a discussion of aerial combat. The next major section is Advanced Magic, covering the magical rules of the game in much the same way that Advanced Combat did. It begins with a general introduction of magic, as well as some Sidri-specific lore on wizards, then goes on to the basic rules of how to cast spells. There's rules for rolling to hit, although they're similar to those used in combat, including critical hits and automatic misses. Talk of the various types of spells follows, basically missile spells, or spells that project missile attacks, thrown spells, or spells that affect one target, creation spells that make images or creatures, etc., and then special spells. Each of these spell types may have a few subtypes, and where applicable rules for dealing with those subtypes are listed, such as dealing with disbelieving delusions, dealing with wall-type spells, and so forth. Rules for continuous spells follow, or rather spells with a duration, and the effects that iron and silver have on magic, basically penalizing wizards for wearing armor. Rules for casting spells from spellbooks are given, which are necessary because wizards can only actually know a set number of spells based on their intelligence and whatever experience they've invested, but they can cast spells from books, albeit really slowly. This may be uh, useful for certain utility spells. Scrolls are detailed next, which follow certain rules for magic scrolls that are pretty common for other RPGs. Rules for magical equipment and labs follow, which are more useful for dealing with long-term spells and developing items. And then rules are given for gestures and incantations, basically expanding on the rules for casting from books. There's some discussion of wishes, which are a little bit more commonly available in the fantasy trip, at least by default. Finally, there's some talk about learning new spells and researching new spells. The next section talks about chemists and alchemists, which are basically grouped together as two different ways to produce consumable items. Rules for said items follow, including potions and bombs, and then the various types of potions are listed, divided into chemist potions and alchemist potions, each of which has a name, a description, and then a cost to purchase or produce. The magic items section follows, and spends a fair amount of time on the wizard's staff, which is the primary magic items that most wizards will be using. There's then rules for creating lesser and greater magic items. There is a limit on how many items a particular character may wield, but each of them may have a certain number of effects, up to a limit, of course, which allows for actually a quite variety of magical effects that a character can have, even with a limited number of items you know, available. The item creation table then follows, spanning a few pages, and goes into a fair amount of depth on the various effects that can be imbued on items. After the rules for item creation are finished, some example magic items are detailed, first lesser and then greater magic items. Like spells and traits, they are divided into tiers, this time by the intelligence needed to craft them. Some of the example items are actually unique, being more than just a few different selected spells. The chapter wraps up with dealing with rare and unusual items, disenchanting and destroying items, and then buying and selling items. The final two parts of the book are a few pages describing the village of Benwin and the greater area of southern Alentia. Basically a ready-made home base for new adventurers to uh, tool around in uh, in case the GM doesn't have anything specific prepared. So all in all, the fantasy trip in the labyrinth is a culmination of development throughout the prior fantasy trip offerings, all made into a relatively solid full RPG from its tactical game roots. Although still somewhat focused on the idea of dungeon crawling, it has enough rules, at least different types of rules aspects, to take it beyond into the greater world at large. A world which is well developed enough to serve as a cross-genre setting, and yet unmapped and open for enough expansion to allow for basically any type of game to be set in it.
I find that the system itself is surprisingly well developed for the time it originated in. The fantasy trip is a product of the late 70s and the turn of the 80s, and as such, I came into this examination expecting it to be very primitive, and as I looked at the uh, melee and wizard offerings, they were on the primitive side, but the system as expanded within the labyrinth is about on par with what you would expect from a modern system, really, thus turning the fantasy trip from a mere historical curiosity into something that should be examined as an actual playable system, and one which meets that standard fairly readily. If you are interested in the historical aspects, one can identify early elements of the GURP system within the greater framework of the fantasy trip. The point by nature of the system was also rather new for the time. Uh, if you look for the creatures and lore of the world, it reads like something straight out of late 70s fiction before the modern tropes of fantasy gaming were really fleshed out. And while there are elements of Tolkien-esque nature baked into it, that's about as far as it goes, with monsters otherwise feeling relatively unique compared to many other later systems, with just a dash of the tongue-in-cheek that was common at that time. See the dreaded Piranakeet birds as an example. However, I found that, in practice, the system was actually relatively robust. It supports most of what I would personally put into any adventure, even one that wasn't a dungeon crawl necessarily, and the XD6-based mechanics are quick to use, at least once one gets used to them. If you've experienced playing the GURP series, then the dice system from the Fantasy Trip should be relatively easy to pick up, although there are some differences. And indeed, even though I do realize that they are technically two entirely different systems, the fact that they're from the same designer invites the comparison between the Fantasy Trip and GURPS, and once you do put them side by side, the lineage becomes glaringly obvious. Character building will feel very familiar to a fan of GURPS, although much more streamlined and without all the quirky point-by aspects in GURPS. Gone are the complex abilities and point totals, the derived stats and so forth, but a number of the actual talents and their effects may seem quite familiar. Combat shares some pretty strong similarities, especially in the way that the Fanny Tree Trip handles the hex-based combat, spellcasting, and tactical situations such as dropped or broken weapons, although of course it doesn't do it to the same depth that GURPS does. I like the production value of the book, although I got the physical version with my copy of the Fantasy Trip Legacy Edition box set, and thus I can't comment too much on how the standalone version might hold up. Still, it is easy to navigate, which I've mentioned before, which is a huge plus when running and playing any game. I would go so far as to say that I would actually recommend the Fantasy Trip in the Labyrinth as a good system for people looking to get into the fantasy role-playing games, even if they're relative beginners, but who may be looking for something much different than the usual ubiquitous D20-derived systems and clones. Most of my qualms about the Fantasy Trip have less to do with the system itself, but rather the circumstances surrounding it. The fact is that it's an older system, and it may put some people off, even though it's only relatively become widely available again. This lack of development throughout the years and the use of a hex grid for combat might minorly raise the barrier to entry for new groups who might find the square grid or mind's eye based system somewhat easier to get people into, although I, I say that's, that's not a huge drawback. One point was brought up to me by a viewer some time ago, and one is that I actually agree quite readily with, and that is that the fantasy trip directly competes with another of Steve Jackson Games' own products, dungeon fantasy role-playing game, which I've also reviewed. Both focus on dungeon-crawling fantasy, point-by-based systems, grid-based systems, with a high degree of tactical options. They cater to basically the same audience, with the differences being mostly that the fantasy trip will play a little faster, while the dungeon fantasy will offer greater character customization offer more variety in character powers. But that's not a fault of the system itself. I'm glad to have the fantasy trip available now, and one can only wonder what would have happened if it had been able to be revised and developed over the years. Then again, you know, maybe, just maybe, one doesn't have to wonder too much. At any rate, I'm going to wrap it up here. As always, I'll put links to where you can pick up the game in the description below. This does not conclude my look into the Fantasy Trip system, because I will be looking at the rest of the material in the Legacy Edition box set at some point, which bundles a bunch of classic Fantasy Trip products together. For now, this has been the RPG Crawler with my review of the Fantasy Trip in the Labyrinth. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content, both tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye.
And if you're still watching this far, I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have supported this channel via Patreon or direct donations throughout the years, without which this channel could not have lasted as long as it has. For those who are feeling particularly generous, you can still support my work through Patreon and now through Subscribestar as well, through the links in the description below.